Imagine a problem where you're trying to figure out the inverse sine of square root of 3 over 2. If you're using a unit circle, you know that when you're dealing with sine, you deal with the y values. So here's a y value, square root of 3 over 2. Here's another y value, square root of 3 over 2. Are there two answers? Well, if you look at it, these two, whether it's 60 degrees or pi over 3, or 2 thirds pi or 120, both of those angles make the sine square root of 3 over 2. So you think that there's two possible solutions for this problem. But no, a calculator only says there's one solution. Now imagine a problem where you're doing the inverse cosine of square root of 3 over 2. Well, cosine you deal with x values. So looking at the unit circle, we find a x value square root of 3 over 2. We find another x value square root of 3 over 2. You think, oh, 30 degrees, pi over 6 is one possible answer, or you think maybe 330. 11 pi over 6 is an answer, but no. The calculator only gives you one possible answer. Why is that? Pay attention to this video, and you'll find out. This is MathGuide.com, and my name is Mark Karadimos. Let's go back and look at something that we're familiar with. We're familiar with this square curve. This square curve is a upward facing parabola. If we wanted to find the inverse of this parabola, we would take a diagonal line, in other words, y equals x, and we would reflect it over that diagonal line. And what we would get is, if I draw this carefully, we get a sideways parabola. There's an issue here though because this inverse, which is a sideways parabola, is not a function. Notice that there's two branches on top of each other and it doesn't pass the vertical line test. The original square curve does pass the vertical line test, so the original function, original relation is a function. But when you look at the inverse relation, it doesn't pass the vertical line test. So we have an issue. Okay, what do we do so that when we take the inverse of the square curve, we also get a function. We restrict the domain. Okay, so if, what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to take the original function and I'm going to insist, for, for instance, that the x values be greater than or equal to zero. Now what that does is it changes the graph. So now the original curve, if I could do this quickly, only has one branch. It has only one branch. Now, if I reflect this one branch over the diagonal line, let's see if I could do this quickly. Well, kind of. Now what's gonna happen is I have a sideways parabola, but now this sideways parabola only has one branch. Now it, it is a function. Okay, now that does slightly change my equation. So now the equation, instead of having a plus minus, it's just the square root of x. So when we restrict the original domain of the function, when we take its inverse, we also get an inverse that is a function. We're gonna have to do the same thing with the trig functions. We're gonna do that next. So I've taken the liberty of drawing these sinusoids, sine on the left, cosine on the right. If we try to find the inverse functions using these graphs and we reflect it over the diagonal line, we run into a problem. Same problem we ran into with the parabola. So what are we left with? We're left with these squiggly lines. You'll notice that these squiggly lines, these inverse, func these inverse relations are not functions. They don't pass the vertical line test. So what do we have to do? We have to restrict the domains of the original functions. So that means what we're going to have to do is grab portions of the curve so that when we do reflect them over the diagonal line, we will get functions. All right, so what I've done is I've taken a portion of the curve just like this, right? So if you look at the sine curve, I just took the section of the curve that goes from negative 90 to positive 90. And I have that section of the curve, the original sine curve. Now, if you look at the right side, the cosine curve, the cosine curve 
um, I've taken the portion that goes from 0 to pi. So I've got that section. When we take those restricted domains and then reflect them, we get functions. So now we're getting a function that looks something like this for our inverse. Now this one's a little bit trickier to draw with the cosine. It goes something like this. Okay, something like that, but that's the inverse. So what you're seeing right now over here, the, the dark curve, you have the inverse of uh, f, which is just the inverse sine. And over here we have the inverse for g, which is the inverse cosine. So at this point, you need to have a graphic to help you understand what the domain restrictions are. And that's what you're going to see right here. So sine, cosine, and tangent. And I know I didn't talk about tangent in this video, but if you're looking at the sine function, you use quadrants 1 and 4. When you're using the tangent function, you use quadrants 1 and 4 also. But cosine is the strange one. You use quadrants 1 and 2. So what are the domain restrictions for the sine function? You use negative 90 to positive 90. For cosine, you strange one, you're going to go from 0 to 180. I'm trying to talk degrees and right radians. Okay, now from tangent, you're going to go negative 90 to positive 90. And there you go. Uh, this will help you remember the domain restrictions when you're doing those inverse functions and you're looking for the correct angle for your final answer, even if you're using the unit circle. So this has been another video provided to you by MathGuy.com. Make sure you go back to MathGuy.com. We've got hundreds, literally hundreds of lessons, interactive quizzes, and more instructional videos. You won't regret it. Take care. Have a great day. See you soon. That really is a helpful graphic. Yep. It's helpful.